So at this moment in time, we're going to talk a little bit about cholesterol. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. For prodromal, you're just saying that the patient would feel sick. That would be that symptom. Mm -hmm. Just feeling sick. Right. Okay. Just feeling sick. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about cholesterol and a little bit more about its role in atherogenesis and heart attack. Now, one of the one of the issues with cholesterol is that it's a little bit difficult to study. When you guys get your cholesterol checked, first of all, how many of you have ever gotten your cholesterol checked? Is there anyone here who has not gotten their cholesterol checked? So some of you didn't raise your hand either time. So would that be the same as getting like a regular CBC done, or is that no. totally different? Okay. It's different than a CBC. Then no. Then no. Then no. Okay. So the general recommendation is that all adults should have cholesterol screening every five years, starting at age twenty. Now, what does the word screen mean? Going back to uh, health assessment, what does it mean to screen? It means to test regardless of symptomatology. So you don't have to have symptoms, we're gonna check anyway. So every time you go to the doctor's office and they check your blood pressure, what are they doing? Screening. They're screening you for high blood pressure. So screening is considered what form of prevention? Do you remember that? Primary. Secondary. secondary. So it's a secondary um, intervention for secondary prevention. So cholesterol. Cholesterol is a substance that is vital for life. It is the backbone of a lot of our hormones, such as testosterone and estrogen. And it is also an essential component in holding our cell membranes together. We used to think that cholesterol was mainly derived from diet. So you ate cholesterol foods and that caused your cholesterol to go up. Now, Eating high cholesterol foods will have a small effect on your cholesterol, but the majority of the cholesterol in your body is produced by your body. So if you eat higher cholesterol diet, your body will synthesize less cholesterol. And if you eat a low cholesterol diet, your body will synthesize more cholesterol. So it's not the cholesterol intake per se that is responsible for high or low cholesterol. Cholesterol is in large part a result of our genetics, and it requires a certain amount of fat in order to make. So certain types of fat are more highly associated with higher cholesterol levels. So in general, the saturated fats are associated with higher levels of cholesterol. Monounsaturated fats are associated with lower levels of cholesterol. And what about polyunsaturated fats? Well, the last thing you should ever do is a Google search for that, because you will find all sorts of conflicting information. Information. It is the worst thing ever. It is the best thing ever. They are healthy. They're terrible. They're evil. They're wonderful. But one thing we do know about unsaturated fats is that polyunsaturated fats are the most likely to oxidize. What does that mean? Yeah. And so ox oxidized fats are more inflammatory. So if you are going to eat unsaturated fat, like corn oil, saf uh, sunflower oil, safflower oil, rapeseed oil, all those things, you want to make sure that they are as fresh as possible, and you want to store them in a cool, dark place. If you smell <sighs> rancid, don't eat them. Throw them away. Question: What about the the cholesterol that that we get from the yolks of the, of eggs? A lot of people have like misconceptions, like saying like, "Oh, like you should stay away from it because it's too much." With yeah. Your if you eat cholesterol from eggs, your body will produce less cholesterol. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. E there's nothing wrong with eating eggs per se. Now, how many have ever had a real egg? like an egg from a farm. What does it look like? It's very yellow. 
orangey. It's like the yolk is like super dark yellow, almost orange, or maybe it is orange. And if you crack it into something flat, it's like this really giant, like little ball. Whereas if you get like our factory farm eggs, what are those like? Kind of like this little pale yellow flat thing. If you ever try and poach one of the eggs you get from the store, it's just kind of like, where like you poach a, like a, a farm egg and it's like stays together and it's nice and I don't eat them, but you know, I've seen it. So anyway, um, just be aware that not all eggs are created equal in terms of quality. Now, in terms of the, the cooking quality, you can see the difference. The question is, can your body tell the difference? Some people say, some people say, and guess what? There's no scientific studies that really help us to know whether that's true or not. So if you want to support a local farmer, I say go for it. But you will pay more for your eggs. It'll probably tastes better. My wife's like, I can't tell a difference. I'm like, oh, I can tell. Whatever. Let's move on. So cholesterol. So cholesterol is um, produced in our cells all over our bodies, and then it's used for a number of things. Now, um, cholesterol, when we transport it in the blood, when we transport lipid in the blood, lipid is not water soluble. So we've got to package it up. Okay, so what is that? What are these little phospholipids? So what do the little lines represent? Fatty acid chains. Fatty acid chains. And what do the little round balls represent? The phospho part. Okay, so these are phospholipids. The phosphate part is water soluble. The lipid part is fat soluble. So this little package is got fat in the center and then it's got water soluble on the outside. And that is going to allow us to, to transport fatty things through the blood. Okay, so if the substance inside of this is triglyceride, what's triglycerides, by the way? <laughs> it is a storage form of fat. So, when your liver, when you eat food, your liver creates triglycerides in response to insulin. And then it sends those out into the blood, and then those are taken up by fat cells and muscle cells. Muscle cells use them for energy, fat cells use them for... Storage. Storage. <clears throat> okay. What's inside of them? Triglycerides. Now, this particle, this triglyceride phospholipid poly, uh, particle, is called a very low density lipoprotein. What is the what, what does the second L stand for? Lipoprotein. So lipo because it's got fatty protein because it's got a phospho protein on it. Does that make sense? Protein, fat. Protein, fat. Lipo, protein. Better? Yeah. Okay. So, this whole molecule is called a? Very low density And what is inside of it? The fat. Triglycerides. Triglycerides. Okay, and the triglycerides are being moved around your body for storage in muscle, muscle. muscles and fat. and fat cells. Fair enough, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, you can also have a particle that looks similar to that, but it's filled with cholesterol. And there's two major types of cholesterol molecules. One of them is called LDL, low-density lipoproteins. Those are 
basically you can think of them as excess cholesterol that is being sent back to your liver. The liver has LDL receptors on it, which it uses to pull the cholesterol out of the blood. The higher the number of LDL receptors in your liver, the lower your LDL levels will be. Can you repeat that one more time? The more, the more LDL receptors you have in your liver, the lower your LDL cholesterol or LDL will be. Then we have what are known as high density lipoproteins. So, by the way, LDL molecules are relatively small. HDL molecules are relatively large. Okay, hold on, we'll get to that in a second. So, HDL is typically associated with a lower risk of atherosclerosis, whereas LDL is associated with a higher risk of atherosclerosis. But it's not that simple because there are multiple subparticles of each of them. And some HDL is protective and some HDL is not. Some HDL is actually predictive of having atherosclerosis. Now, when you get a cholesterol panel, you are not going to get the number of these particles. What they're going to do is they're going to break open those particles and see how much goo is inside. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So, you're not going to get LDL, you're going to get LDL-C. And you're not going to get HDL, you're going to get HDL-C. What does the C represent? How much cholesterol is inside? Now let me ask you this question. If you're baking a cake, is it more important to know the volume of egg that comes out of the shells, or is it more important to know the number of egg particles? The number of eggs? The number of eggs. It's actually more important to know the egg volume. How many of you ever shopped at Costco? What are those eggs like? Little dinosaur eggs, right? Those are, those are big eggs. And, and some recipes actually don't work well with Costco eggs because they're so big. So when you're making a cake, when you're doing baking, what's more important is the volume of stuff inside. Now, if I'm gonna throw eggs at you and try and hit you with an egg, what's more important? The amount of egg inside or the number of eggs I'm throwing? Number the number of eggs I'm throwing. So when it comes to predicting heart disease, what's more important? The amount of cholesterol inside or the number of particles? And as it turns out, it's the number of particles. But what are we measuring? The We're measuring how much stuff is inside. So it is a very indirect measure at best. They do have, they do have lab tests where you can measure the actual number of particles but they're more expensive, and there hasn't been as much research done on how many particles and whatever actually is going to be associated with heart attacks. Now, if you read the official literature, there is a dose-response relationship between cholesterol and heart disease. What does that mean, a dose-response? The dose increase factor. It means the higher your cholesterol, the higher your risk. Is that a true statement? Why, yes it is. So, if you, if you graph heart attack risk and heart disease risk, it looks kind of like this. Now, where does your risk really start going up? So, this is heart attack risk. And this is total cholesterol. Where, where does your risk really start to go up? Towards the end. Towards the end, right? So would you put, would you say it really starts to go up maybe about there? Yeah. But I mean, but there's a little bit of like, I don't, I don't know, maybe there? Maybe, maybe there? Where, where should you draw the line? In the beginning then? So. In between here and here, that's 200, and this is 240. 
So in this little range, it's beginning to go up, but it's not really high yet. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is sometimes known as the gray zone. So that if you're above 200, you are at increased risk of a heart attack, but by how much? Mm -hmm. eh, eh, not a lot, a little. Just for total. Yeah, just for total. Once you get above 240, you have a very clear increase in risk. But there's a confounding factor. What is a confounding factor? It's a, something else that's also influencing things. As it turns out, the people with 240 and higher cholesterol tend to have a genetic disorder called familial hypercholesterolemia. Those patients tend to have very high cholesterols, 250, 300, higher even. Patients with familial hypercholesterolemia have a higher risk of heart attack that the rest of the population does not. Now, the problem is that many of the studies that looked at cholesterol risk did not exclude those patients. So if you don't have familial hypercholesterolemia, what is the impact of your cholesterol on your heart attack risk? And the answer is? You don't know. I don't know. Another problem is that the way that some of the studies were designed didn't really help us to understand the risk. So for example, there was a study called the Mr. Fit study, multiple risk factor intervention trial. M R fit. And what they did was they took patients' cholesterols and they divided the, the group up into 10 groups. So what's it called when you divide something up into a hundredths and you rank people by the, where they score on a, on a scale of a hundred? Well, if you took the T's, you got one of these, by the way. Oh, don't I'll answer at once now. It's not like you had statistics or anything. <laughs> it's called a percent. I didn't say that. <laughs> You're not loud enough. Percent what? I said percentile. Percentile. Okay. okay. So if you break them up into 10 groups, we call it a decile. Now, the people with very, very high cholesterol, where are they going to sit? They're going to sit in the... 10th decile, in the highest decile. Where are the people down here going to score? In the lowest decile. Now, what they did in the Mr. Fit study was they compared this group to this group, and they said the risk of having a heart attack is dramatically higher from here to here. But this group contained people with familial hypercholesterolemia. So now let me ask you this question. Let's say you don't have familial hypercholesterolemia. And let's say that you're not in the 10th decile, you're in the 9th decile. What is your impact on having a heart attack compared to that group? And the answer is? Not that much. We don't know because they didn't report it. So we did all this research, and we did these giant studies, but we didn't report what would be meaningful. What's if you're in here, we don't know because we didn't do that analysis. Maybe the cynical side of me says that maybe the reason is that they did do it and it didn't turn out to be anything, so that wasn't very exciting to talk about. But this was exciting because that's a big difference. And if you're a researcher, do you want something exciting or something boring? Exciting. It's called publication bias. You're much more likely to have your study published if you found something than if you didn't find anything. Think about the news. Millions of people went up and got up and went to work today. Is that news? No. Yeah. Someone died. Is that news? Yeah. There's a saying, if it bleeds, it leads, right? So... <laughs> Yeah, we are conditioned to pay attention to anomalies, to things out of the ordinary. And unfortunately, there is a bias in research towards that. So the cynical side of me says, 
They didn't find much in here, so that's why they didn't talk about it. Is it the truth? I don't know. But what's the point? The point is, cholesterol clearly has an association with heart attacks. But is it meaningful enough that we need to worry about it if you don't have familial hypercholesterolemia? And the answer is... We don't know. Kind of. <laughs> but, eh. Yeah, exactly. So, all of that to say that there is an association. Cholesterol does play a part, but it's not the underlying driving factor. What's the underlying driving factor? No. It's arterial endothelial inflammation. inflammation. So, should you be concerned with your cholesterol? It depends. If you've got lots and lots of risk factors for heart disease and you have high, blood, high cholesterol, you should probably worry about it. If the only risk factor that you have is high cholesterol? Is it meaningful? It could be. It might not be. I don't know. So, all of that to say, you've got to be a little bit more careful. If you're really concerned about your heart attack risk, what is probably the best thing you could do in terms of diagnostic tests? Cholesterol. Not cholesterol. We mentioned it earlier. Not in this part of the lecture, or before the break. Cardiac uh, calcium. calcium score. Uh, so, um, so anyway, that would probably be the, if you're really concerned, that'd probably be the best thing to do. The problem with cholesterol is it can overestimate your risk of a heart attack based on high levels of cholesterol, but half of all patients who have heart attacks have normal cholesterol. So, not only does it overestimate some people's risk, it underestimates other people's risk. So, why do we use it so much? Well, that's a good question. Part of it is, for a while, that's all we had. And part of it is, there's a little bit of an industry that's grown around testing and treating it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... When you get cl your cholesterol, the first thing is the total cholesterol. And this, is, this is the curve that's traditionally associated with, with total cholesterol. But then we have a breakdown of LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. Now, HDL cholesterol is measured directly. And then LDL cholesterol is calculated from your HDL and your total cholesterol. But in order to calculate it, your triglycerides can't be too high. If your triglycerides are too high, it messes up the LDL calculation. So, to prevent your, LD, your VLDL from your triglycerides from messing things up, you want to fast for at least 12 hours. Fasting for 12 hours will reduce your triglyceride level, which will hopefully mean that your LDL calculation will be meaningful. Does that make sense? LDL will be meaningful. Yeah, the LDL calculation. So total cholesterol is measured directly. HDL is measured directly. Triglycerides are measured directly. What is calculated? LDL. LDL. C. What does the C mean? Cholesterol. It's the amount of cholesterol inside the particles, not the actual number of particles. All right, any questions so far on what a cholesterol panel is? What does a cholesterol panel consist of? Your total cholesterol and these three items. What's the other name for VLDL? Triglycerides. Triglycerides. So, what is the best way to reduce triglycerides? Faster 12 hours. Okay, in the short term, it's to fast for 12 hours. Um, in the long term, it is to lose weight and eat a lower carbohydrate diet. Now, when we hear the term lower carbohydrate diet, a lot of us think of different things. 
The way that most dietitians describe high or low carbohydrate diet is through the percentage of carbohydrate in the diet. And what I am talking about is the total amount of carbohydrate. So if you're eating 5,000 calories, but you're only eating 40% from, from carbohydrate, people would call that a low carbohydrate diet because it's only 40%. But what's 40% to 5,000 calories? That's 2,000 calories of just carbohydrate. Now, on the other hand, if you're eating a 2,000 calorie diet, that's 60% carbohydrate, that would be considered a normal carbohydrate diet. What's 60% of 2,000? It's like 1,200. So 1,200 high carbohydrate diet out of a 2,000 is still lower than the 40% low carbohydrate diet. Does that make sense why it's the total amount of carbohydrate is more important than the percent? Okay. So what we want to do is eat fewer calories, and in particular, fewer what kind of calories? Carbohydrate. carbohydrate. So people who go on ketogenic diets typically have very good triglyceride levels because they're eating almost no carbohydrate. As a result, they typically are going to decrease their to overall total calories, and those two things together help to lower um, triglyceride levels. Do you need to go that extreme? No. If you prefer to go that extreme, will it hurt you? Probably not. What's the keyword? Probably. Probably not. We don't really have enough evidence. It also depends. Is the way that you're being ketogenic, eating lots of fresh vegetables every day with, with uh, fresh salad dressing on it? Or is it by eating just, you know, bacon and, well, more bacon? Does that make sense? So, I mean, not that bacon is inherently unhealthy, but if you're eating a large amount of processed meats and other processed food, and that is my ketogenic diet, low carbohydrate diet, or I'm eating lots of fresh vegetables, broccoli, lettuce, kale, along with some meat, that's very, very different, right? And they're both low carbohydrate, they're both ketogenic. So just because a person is keto, they're not equal. But they will both typically have the result of lowering VLDL levels. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, but again, you don't have to go that extreme. You just need to eat fewer calories and lower carbohydrates overall. All right. Um, so when a person has high cholesterol, especially if they have elevated risk factors, then we're going to want to lower their cholesterol levels. Now, there have been a couple different um, levels over the past few years. So first, I'm going to show you what I grew up with, and then we'll go to slightly lower levels, which are currently recommended. So back in the day, what was known as the ATP3 guidelines, You started off by asking how many cardiovascular risk factors a person had. What was the question there? No? Nothing? No. Just, just talking. <laughs> talking smack. All right. So CV, cardiovascular, RF, risk factors. So if the patient had zero risk factors, then their LDL should be less than 160. If they had one cardiovascular risk factor, the LDL should be less than 130. And if they had two cardiovascular risk factors, it should be under 100. So it was relatively straightforward. You just counted up risk factors, and then you had a different LDL target based on that. How often are you supposed to get screened? Every five years. Every five years. If you add high cholesterol, how do, we know, how do we know what high means? We look at the number of risk factors. So based on the number of risk factors, that'll give us a target LDL. So if you were above your target, 
So say you had one cardiovascular risk factor, you're supposed to be under 130, and let's say it was 145. What would we do? Put you on a drug? No. No, what would we do? TLC. TLC, therapeutic lifestyle changes. What are the therapeutic lifestyle changes? Traditionally, it was eat a lower fat diet. Now that dash diet can work, but eat a lower fat diet, exercise, stop smoking. Maybe have a glass of red wine. No more than one a day, please. Above one doesn't help. It can actually hurt. Uh, by the way, how many of you are afraid of, of drinking diet drinks, but also drink alcohol? I have friends who are like deathly afraid of Splenda, but they have no problem drinking alcohol. Did you know that alcohol is more carcinogenic than Splenda? In order to get to a carcinogenic effect of Splenda, you basically have to drink like three liters of Splenda drink. You know, drinks sweetened with Splenda per day, every day. In order to get carcinogenic level of alcohol, you need four drinks. Now, I, I don't know what kids are like these days. Is it a day? Yeah, in a day. Oh, for the rest of your life. Yeah, but I'm just saying, once you get to four, you're above the carcinogenic threshold. So I don't know how I don't know how they make kids nowadays. <laughs> I don't know how they make kids nowadays, but when I was in college, four drinks was the warm up before you went out. Yeah, like we're gonna go out later. We are, we're gonna go out. We're gonna go out and, and dance tonight. You guys want to go? Okay, sure. You, you get there. They're like, the, you're already sloshed. Oh, uh, we had jello shots before we started. Slosh. Yeah. Slosh. You, you don't know this term slosh? No. no. It, it's, it's pretty self explanatory. Yeah. But does it matter that, like, the dream? What are you guys saying? It's not that old of a word. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Thanks for coming to my aid there. Yeah. yeah. You're just not that, that uh, acquainted with alcohol culture. That's what it is. Okay, does it matter what kind of alcohol? No. So the way that we, the way that we measure alcohol, if you remember from, from health assessment, is by a drink, which is standardized as one shot, which is an ounce, or like one and a half ounces of liquor, or like one five ounce glass of wine, or one 12 ounce beer. So that, that amount of alcohol is what we mean by a drink. So if you have double shots, two double shots and you're already at what's considered binge drinking and you've already crossed that <laughs> threshold of carcinogenic. So I just find it funny sometimes when people are afraid to drink a diet drink because it's got Splenda or NutraSweet in it, when you'd have to drink like gallons of the stuff to become carcinogenic. And then meanwhile, they have no problem kicking back four or five drinks in a night. Not that they do it all the time, but they don't worry about it. It's like, yeah. So, so it's one of those things where we just have to understand that if you're going to be concerned about the carcinogenic effect of aspartame, you should also be about worried about the carcinogenic effect of alcohol. Well, you know, I can only worry about so many things, and I'd rather worry. <laughs> Okay, that's fine, but then they drink regular Coke instead, and now you've got the issues of insulin resistance and all that. So the problem with Coke, regular Coke, is not that it's got high, fruct high fructose corn syrup in it. What's the problem with Coke? Calories. It's the calories. And it's so easy, especially nowadays, you know, what they call a medium drink, we used to call a large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, if you go to Chipotle, and then, would you like a large drink? Why, sure. They'll give you a 32 ounce drink. The small is a 22. It used to be back in the day that a, 20, that a small was a 16 ounce and a medium was a 22. And then a large was a 32. So if you take that 32 ounce and you fill it up with Coke, how many calories are in that? 800. Dang. Now, if you refill it, so you drink two of those. Like three quarters of your daily intake. That's sixteen hundred calories. If you're on a two thousand calorie diet, that's it. <laughs> yeah, and you had a, you had burger and fries with that, which by itself was a thousand calories. Your one meal 
is now almost double your daily calories. So that's the problem with Coke. So if you have a can of Coke, you're probably okay. If you're having, but who, who drinks one can of Coke? That's what I just said. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> so anyway, um, on average, you are far better risking the aspartame or Splenda than you are the sugar from regular soda. And you're better off risking the aspartame or Splenda than you are alcohol. But it's your life. You do whatever you want. <laughs> Back to our story. I don't even know how we got on this. Um, <laughs> TLC, that's how. One, one glass, no more, of red wine. Um, there is some evidence to suggest it is not red wine per se, but any alcohol can work. However, going above one drink per day has no additional effect and actually might be worse for a heart attack. And then it has other effects as well on your liver and cancer and whatever. So those would be your TLCs. Exercise, stop smoking, change your diet, and wine. a glass of red wine a day. If those are not good enough, so you wait typically about three months, come back, check it again. If it's still too high, then at that time we consider drugs. Now I'm going to skip to, usually we go in the drugs in the order that they were um, invented, but we're going to skip straight to the most important one, which is the statins. We mentioned them before the break when we talked about MI, that if you've had an MI, you're going to be on, put on a statin. Now, they're called statins because they all end in statin. But the actual drug class is like acetyl HMG, acetyl coenzyme A receptor inhibitors or something like that. They inhibit an enzyme that is responsible for, in part, the production of cholesterol. But that's not how they actually lower cholesterol. The way that they lower cholesterol is by inhibiting that enzyme, your liver will respond by producing more LDL receptors. And what do we say about more LDL receptors? LDL. It lowers your amount of cholesterol because the liver will take up more of those LDLs. So that's the way they work. The HMG coenzyme, acetyl coenzyme A receptor inhibitors, or not receptor, but inhibitors work by inhibiting the, the, the slowest step in cholesterol production. By lowering cholesterol production, it stimulates the liver to produce more LDL receptors. These are the statins. Okay. So statins work by inhibiting the production of cholesterol, which in turn causes the liver to produce more LDL. more LDL receptors, and that is the mechanism that they use to lower cholesterol. But, but wait, there's more. Statins also have what are known as pleiotropic effects, <laughs> which is a fancy way of saying side effects or other effects. They also cause a reduction in inflammation. What's the driving factor behind atherosclerosis, atherogenesis? Inflammation. Inflammation. They also stabilize plaques, make them less likely to rupture. Is that caused by a reduction in, in cholesterol? We don't know. So there's a number of pleiotropic effects. There's some others I'm drawing a blank on at the moment, but there's a number of pleiotropic effects that may be responsible for why statins help to reduce heart attacks. What we do know for sure is that statins were the very first drug class that treated cholesterol and lowered the risk of heart attack. So there were other drug classes before statins were invented that lowered cholesterol. But when you looked at do they actually reduce heart attacks, the answer was no. Does that make sense? Now, when you do heart attack research, what is a major problem? Think about this for a moment. How do we know that you actually had a heart attack? Say again? Death of the cells. So you have to do what? Diagnostic tests. You have to do diagnostic tests. What kind? ECG or enzymes. 
No. In the 60s, do we have ECGs and enzymes? No. Well, we had ECGs, but half the people who have a heart attack don't have one, right? right. Do we have enzymes? No. no. I don't know. Maybe. If we did, were they widespread? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, has a person had a heart attack, yes or no? What if they die before they get to the hospital? Do you know whether they had a heart attack or not? No. So, one of the problems with heart attack research is how do you know they actually had a heart attack? And so what they sometimes do is they go by what's called mortality. So you want to see not just if we saved heart attacks, but have patients actually lived longer, fewer deaths in a certain amount of time. And as it turns out, statins were the very first drug that reduced both heart attacks and death. One of the reasons doctors love mortality so much when it comes to research is it's hard to fake dead. You can quibble about, did they have a heart attack? Did they have a stroke? Did they die of the heart attack? Did, what was the actual cause of death? But when it comes to, was the patient dead, yes or no? That one is pretty easy. So that's why mortality is the ultimate goal in medical research. But, what's the mechanism for reducing heart attacks and death? Is it because they lower cholesterol, or is it because of these pleiotropic effects? And the answer is, we don't, know. We don't really know. So, the, um, the official word by the powers that be, the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, the European Heart Association, what they say is, which one do they say? It's the cholesterol lowering. But there are a number of scientists and physicians who think, no, it's not. It's the pleiotropic effects. Which one of them are right? I don't know. I'm certainly not smart enough to know. But I do know that there is some controversy. However, who's got all the money? The people who say it's the cholesterol. <laughs> So, leave this out for our safety. <laughs> no, that's fine. So, now when statins first came out, they did lower heart attack risk, but they didn't lower it that much. Fast forward a few years, and they began to dramatically be more effective. Now, what happened during that time? Did the statins get better, or did something else change? <laughs> Well, there's two things that happened. One is we actually did invent better statins, but some of the times it was the same statin that was being studied. The main thing we did was change who was being studied. So imagine for a moment that you need to study 5,000 people who died in order to make a meaningful determination whether this drug worked or not. How many people do you need to study if you're studying patients at the highest risk of having a heart attack? Let's say that your risk of dying of a heart attack is 20%, and you need 5,000 of them to have a heart attack. How many people do you need to study total? I don't know how to do that, Dr. Neiman. I don't know math. <laughs> I don't know how to do fourth grade math, please. Okay, so let's think about that. So, x times 0 0.2 equals 5,000. How do you find that out? You divide. You divide what? The 0 0.2 by the... You divide the 5,000 by 0 0.2. Here you go. Okay. So if you scoot that over and add a 0 and then divide by 2, what do you get? You need 25,000 people. Is that a lot of people? Yes. And you got to study them for, say, five years. Okay. Now, let's say that you could have people who had a 50% chance of having a heart attack. If you needed 5,000 people to have a heart attack, how many of them would you have to study? 2,500. Are you sure about that? <laughs> so, so, in this case, 0 0.5. You only need to study 10,000. So, which study, which study is cheaper to run, 10,000 
or 25,000? The 10,000. The 10,000. Now imagine for a moment that you wanted to study people who had very low risk, less than 1% of dying in the next five years of a heart attack. How many of them would you have to study? A huge number. Well, let me ask you this question. When are we wanting to prescribe statins to people based on the guidelines? When they have the risk factors. Risk factors plus the their LDL level. So, potentially starting at age 20, right? So, if we start you on a statin at age 20, how many people die of a heart attack at age 20? At 30? At 40? But still pretty low, right? Yeah. You're going to have to make that study last instead of five years. You're going to have to make that study last 30 years to make it meaningful. And you won't know anything for 30 years and it'll be extremely expensive. So do we do that kind of study? No. no. Instead, who do we study? The absolute sickest people. So what we did was we got better at studying the sickest people. Mm -hmm. And guess as it turns out, the sicker you are, the more likely you are to have a heart attack, the more likely statins are to help. So, here you are, you're 25 years old, you're sitting in your doctor's office, you feel fine, you have no problems whatsoever, except a number. And your doctor says, I think you need to start a statin. Should you start that statin? Might it help you prevent a heart attack 20 years from now? It might. Might it do nothing for you for 20 years, except cost you money and cause side effects? It might. But the answer is, we don't know. So, um, statins do help reduce heart attacks and prevent mortality, but they do it best in what kind of people? The sick people. The people who are most likely to have a heart attack. So, the people who should definitely, I'm not saying should be on one, but definitely should consider one, are the patients who, number one, already had a heart attack, and number two, have diabetes. And then, you might also want to consider cardiac calcium score. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I, I skipped something. So, we yeah, we're out of time. Um, so, this is the, the ATP. This is what I learned when I was your age, doing what you're doing right now. But this has been supplanted now by a newer system where we calculate what is called a 10-year ASCVD. What do you think ASCVD? What do you think that stands for? AS atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease risk. So ASCVD risk is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. And then based on your 10-year risk, that will stratify you into the level of LDL that you should get. And we'll actually talk about those specific LDLs levels on the next class. So, where are we going to pick up next class? The LDL levels recommended based on the ASCVD risk. And the treatment of choice is going to be statins. So we'll finish talking about statins next time as well. All right, see you guys next week. <clears throat> so the last time we talked, we had just finished off. We were talking about statins. Um, so the way that statins work is by inhibiting the uh, rate-limiting step in cholesterol synthesis, which in turn causes the liver to produce more LDL receptors. The LDL receptors pull LDL cholesterol or LDL particles out of the blood. And that's how they lower cholesterol and that might be the way that they help reduce heart attacks, or it could be those other pleiotropic effects that we talked about. As far as adverse effects go, statins have the potential to cause liver damage, and they can also cause myopathy, which is muscle pain. Now, if you look at the 
the percentage of patients who supposedly have muscle pain, it seems like it's quite low. But if you ask anyone who's on a statin, they always seem to have, be, have muscle pain. So I don't really know how much actual muscle pain there is, but it's a potential. Now, the ultimate adverse effect is muscle breakdown leading to kidney failure called rhabdomyolysis. And the risk of rhabdomyolysis goes up dramatically when you combine statins with other drugs, especially fibrates. The risk of rhabdomyolysis goes up dramatically when you combine statins with other drugs that can increase the risk of rhabdomyolysis, in particular fibrates, which are another cholesterol drug. So as far as drug names go, um, the original one was lovastatin. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's muscle breakdown. What is a muscle <laughs> primarily made of? Protein. And enormous amounts of protein suddenly being um, filtered into the blood. The kidney tries to filter them out, and you end up with kidney failure. That's rhabdomyolysis. So... The very first statin was lovastatin. It was basically the active substance that's produced by something called red rice yeast. So in order for it to be absorbed, you need to have a snack, or the patient has to have a snack. And cholesterol synthesis is primarily going on at night, so we typically tell patients to take it at night. So when you take it? At night with a snack. That's the only one that needs to be taken with a snack. All the others do not. So then you've got a number of other ones like pravastatin and simvastatin, but for the most part, you're not going to see that many patients on them anymore because of something known as gorilla statins. So what the heck is a gorilla statin? It's just a statin that works better, is more potent. And so the two gorilla statins, the two that you're probably most likely to see, are a torvastatin better known as Lipitor, and Rosuvastatin, also known as Crestor. What about um, the Simvastatin? Yeah, Simvastatin used to be more common, but now that Atorvastatin is, is uh, no longer on patent, it's available generically, yeah. That's what the is I know. I'm going to change that to a Torvastatin. Okay. So, those two are going to be in the test? Um, the one that will be on your test is a Torvastatin. Okay. But I'm fairly certain that you can Thank know you what a statin is a statin. Now, the thing about a Torvastatin and um, Rosuvastatin is that you don't have to take these ones at night because they last so long. Their half-life is so long that you don't need to take them at night because they'll work continuously in your body. With the shorter acting ones, you really need to take it at night to maximize the effect. All right, next we're gonna talk about the newest class of anti-cholesterol drugs, the PCSK9 inhibitors. So PCSK9 is a protein that floats around in your blood and attaches to LDL receptors and is responsible in part for regulating the number of receptors. So imagine for a moment that you got a little LDL receptor right there and a little LDL particle will come up to it and then that will get pulled inside <coughs> and then the cholesterol will get recycled and then that receptor will come back up to the surface. So PCSK9 is a little protein that attaches, and as it comes down, it kind of down-regulates the number of receptors. So they're not recycled as often. So what we do with these inhibitors is they are antibodies that attach to PCSK9. So if here's your little PCSK9, and here you've got your antibody attached, now this is not going to be able to stick to that LDL receptor, and that's going to enhance the recycling of LDL receptors. So more LDL receptors, the lower the cholesterol. So in the end, both statins and P 
PCSK9 inhibitors work similarly in that they ultimately cause an increase in the number of LDL receptors, although they do it by very, very different methods. So um, these drugs are monoclonal, ana monoclonal antibodies that attach to PCSK9. So the two drugs are aliracumab and the other one is evolocumab. So I guess these are the locumabs. And then the drug net, the brand names there are Preluent and Rapatha. Um, now these drugs are injection and you don't have to take them every day. One of them you take, I think, every two weeks and the other one is once a month. <coughs> as far as adverse effects go, the major adverse effects are increased risk of like nasal infections and upper respiratory infections. There's a number of other ones. You can read about them in the book. Um, these are very, very, very uh, potent drugs in terms of their lipid lowering capability. We don't have any long term data yet on reducing heart attacks and strokes, although there is some shorter term trials that have been um, that have come out showing that they do help. Um, now, whether they help only the people at the highest risk, kind of like the statins, not the only, but most likely to help people at the highest risk, or if they're better taken in lower risk patients, that still be, remains to be seen. Um, and not everyone needs to be on a PCSK9, but they are an additional tool in the arsenal, and their kind of role of where they're used best will be discovered over the next couple years as your nurses. So it's an exciting time to be alive. <laughs> All right, next. Next we have older drugs. So we're gonna go back in time. And we're gonna go to the very first cholesterol drug that was ever discovered. And that is bile acid, bile acid sequestrants. So a bile acid sequestrant um, does basically what it says. So one of the components of bile is cholesterol. And what's the purpose of that cholesterol? Right, to help emulsify fats so you can absorb them in your diet. Yeah, uh-huh, sure. Yeah, I remembered that from A&P, uh-huh. So, most, well not most, but a lot of the bile that is, a lot of the cholesterol in the bile that is excreted is resorbed, reabsorbed in the intestine as part of digesting and absorbing fats. Some of it, though, is excreted. And the way that a bile acid sequestrant works is it binds to the cholesterol in your bile and then you poop it out. And that lowers your cholesterol level. The problem with bile acid sequestrants is that, well, in verse effects ago, what do you think the number one would be? Because they bind to cholesterol, one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to have less cholesterol, or more cholesterol being excreted, and that's going to lead to GI adverse effects. So do you think it would be diarrhea or constipation? constipation. Well, you might think it'd be diarrhea, but it's actually constipation. <laughs> and I'm glad that you're reading the answer. Um, the problem with these drugs is that although they do lower cholesterol, they don't actually improve heart attack risk or decrease mortality. So they're very rarely used nowadays, especially because statins work. So, and now the, B, the PCSK9s. But you will still see occasionally a patient on them. Usually elderly patients have been on them for a long time. The next drug that we have is niacin. Because there's not a name to the bile one. Oh, cholesteramine. Which? Cholesteramine. 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 Nope. There's no reason to cloud your mind up with the dose of a drug that you're not going to see very often. And interactions as well. 
interactions with like, the vitamins? The main, yeah, the main interactions are with fat-soluble vitamins. So they're going to inhibit the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. I do expect you to know what fat-soluble vitamins are. Name three. A, D, E, K. Okay, name four. <laughs> Fine, be that way. Overachiever. All right, so next we have niacin. Niacin is a B vitamin, and in high doses, it reduces primarily, um, well, primarily helps raise HDL, and it will lower triglycerides. And it also has a small effect on LDL as well. Now, if you remember from last time, low HDL is a risk factor for heart disease. The question is, is it an independent risk factor or is it just an indicator of other things? So, if it's an independent risk factor, then hopefully by raising HDL, what would happen? You would decrease risk. But if it's just an indicator for other things like smoking and being sedentary and insulin resistance, then raising HDL by itself, will that necessarily help? No. And so there actually have been a number of drugs that were developed that actually raised HDL directly. And guess what? They didn't help heart attacks or, or death. So how helpful is it to raise HDL with niacin? Eh. It does lower triglycerides some. That could be helpful. And it lowers LDL a little bit. Mm, that could be helpful. But for the most part, there are no trials showing that niacin helps to actually improve heart attack and death. Um, there are a number of adverse effects. It can be liver toxic. But the number one adverse effect is flushing. So by flushing, we mean that you turn bright red, like the color of that red trash can over there. Patients will also sometimes complain of feeling itchy and hot at the same time that they flush. So typically what you would do is you have the patient take it at night with some aspirin, and then the idea being that the aspirin will help reduce the risk of flushing, and if they do flush, they will be sleeping during that time. The problem is some patients, the flushing will awake, they'll wake them up from their sleep. And they're like, they might not know it at first. They're like, oh, just go to the bathroom, whatever, and then like, ah! Kind of like a horror movie. You're like, ah, what's happened to me? So that can happen. So what, <clears throat> what is the mechanism? Yeah, we don't know. We're not sure. Yes. We're not 100% sure what the mechanism of action is. It HDL, lowers yes. Can you say that it affects LDL? Like, how does it affect LDL? It lowers LDL, but just a little bit. Do you have to know the sustained and extended? So, yeah, the, the immediate release has the highest risk of flushing, the slow release has a high risk of liver damage, but it is available over the counter. And then there's a prescription version, which is like an intermediate release called Niaspan. And that is supposedly safe for your liver and has a reduced risk of flushing, supposedly. So the best way to raise your HDL, though, is to, number one, lose weight, eat less, stop smoking, and exercise. All right, next we have fibrates. So fibrates primarily lower triglycerides, but they do have some beneficial effects on HDL and LDL as well. But the main reason you're typically going to see these prescribed is in patients who've got high triglycerides. If a patient has triglycerides higher than 400, they are at increased risk of <coughs> acute pancreatitis. <coughs> so that's one of the major reasons why you're going to see patients on these drugs is to lower their triglyceride levels. Uh, two brand names or two drugs. One is Gemfibrazil and the other is Phenofibrate. And what do they both have in them as part of their name? Fibra. Gemfibrazil and phenofibrate. <laughs> nope, for the test you only need to know the one on your list.
But if you see fibra in there, especially on this test, it's probably not just fiber. It's probably a fibrate. Now, it's primarily used for triglycerides because in the podcast it said primarily used for lower LDL. Now that we have statins and PCSK9s, very few people would be prescribed this to lower their LDL. Okay. The major use of it is going to be for, for reducing triglycerides now. The number one adverse effect that you need to watch out for in this one is potential for rhabdomyolysis. And when you give them in combination with the statins, it increases the risk further. <coughs> And the best way to reduce your triglycerides is to lower your calories, reduce your total glucose or total carbohydrate intake, and reducing your calories will usually do that. Exercise is also good. All right, the last thing we're gonna, the last drug we're going to talk about it has no drug class per se, and it's the only drug like it. So it's called. Ezidamide, the brand name is Zedia. So it works kind of like the bile acids questions do in that it reduces the reabsorption of cholesterol in the intestine, but it does it in a completely different way. It basically blocks the receptors that are responsible for pulling the cholesterol back in. So the cholesterol is free to continue on down its way and eventually be pooped up. It's never used, well, I couldn't didn't say never, but almost never used by itself. It is almost always used in combination with patients who already have are on statins, whose um, LDL levels are still too high. So it's usually a second line drug. Any questions about Zedia. It blocks the receptors for what, I think? There's, it blocks the receptors and transport mechanism yeah. okay. that's responsible for pulling cholesterol back into the bloodstream from the intestine. All right, so on that note, I think we're done with cholesterol. Because we had to break up the lecture between last time and this time, there may have been something I've forgotten. But I won't know until I review the tapes next semester. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way the cookie crumbles. So last time we had finished up, we were talking about cholesterol, and we never quite got to how you treat the cholesterol. So um, for several years, there were competing standards of therapy, but now the most common one is going to be the American Heart Association slash American College of Cardiology, so AHA slash ACC guidelines. So in Canvas, I've given you a handout. Basically, I took their 28-page document and I boiled it down to four pages for you. Mm -hmm. And then I gave you guys a copy. Don't expect that online. Mm -hmm. So you will have a copy of it in Canvas. So we're going to go through a little bit of this because it gets complicated. So first, they have 10 take-home points. And then if you flip to page three, you'll begin to see um, a diagram. So the diagram is what they call an algorithm. So it's like, a, well, how do you decide what to do? Well, you follow this really complicated diagram. So if a person already has ASCVD, so atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, then you're going to start them on intensive statin therapy. What does intensive mean? What's the goal of intensive statin therapy? To lower LDL by 50%. So let's say a person's LDL was 180. What would the goal then be? To get it to? What, what's half of 180? Yes. 90. So you'd probably get at least to 90. So that's the goal of intensive therapy is to reduce it by 50%. Um, and really what they would like to do is see it go under 70 in general. So if the person does not have atherosclerotic 
or sorry, atherosclerotic coronary or cardiovascular disease. Oh, by the way, what do we mean by ASCVD? Yes, but how do we know you have it? I don't know. They've had a heart attack. They have stable angina. Or they have positive stress test. So those would be, they've already got it. So if you've already got it, it's pretty clear you should be on a statin. And the recommendation is to reduce the um, cholesterol level, or the LDL level, by 50%. Then there's a number of recommendations based on age. So if you're between 6 and 19 years of age, then we just want to encourage healthy living. If you're above 19 then, um, to 39, then we want to lower your cholesterol primarily through therapeutic lifestyle changes. Once you get to age 40, that's where things begin to change. So at that moment in time, you want to stratify patients based on their atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. So if they are considered low risk, meaning less than 5% of dying in the next 10 years of a cardiovascular event, then there's no statin therapy is recommended, but what we're going to do is encourage healthy living. So encourage healthy living is always the right answer. But if they're in a borderline risk, which is going to be between 5 and 7.5%, then, now let me write these down. So if you're less than 5%, this is for ages 40 to, uh, was it 79? Is that right? 75. 40 to 75, if your ASCVD risk is less than five, we encourage healthy living. If it is borderline, which is gonna be um, five to 7.5, then what we're going to do is we are going to, what are we going to do? Say again? Start a statin. Start a statin potentially. If what is there? Risk. Mm -hmm. Risk enhancers. So between 5 and 7.5%, we're going to ask, are there risk enhancers? So these are things that would enhance a person's risk of having coronary artery disease. So if you look at the little box over here on the left, what does it say on it? Risk enhancers, which include family history of premature ASCVD. That's usually a primary relative, so mom or dad, or brother, sister, who had a heart attack before age 50. Persistent elevated LDL above 160, chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome, we've already talked about how metabolic syndrome increases cardiovascular risk, um, metabolic, or sorry, conditions specific to women such as preeclampsia or premature menopause, inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, HIV, and then ethnicity. So, for example, South Asian ancestry. Um, lipid biomarkers, if they've got significant, if they've got persistently elevated triglyceride levels, that would also be an indication. And then, if they are if they have highly, uh, highly sensitive CRP levels are elevated, LP little a, we talked about that, ApoB, which is another lipid subtype, and then what's called the ankle brachial index, if that's less than 0.9. So you've got a number of things that can enhance risk. If the patient has those risk enhancers, even though they're considered this relatively low risk group, they should probably still start on a statin. That sounds like an alliteration. The next group is intermediate risk, which is going to be 7.5 to 19%. And in this group, we want to start with a moderate statin.
And then if the patient is high risk, which is going to be anything above 20%, we are going to start a high intensity statin. What's the goal of high intensity? Reduce the blood, uh, reduce the LDL by 50%. Yes, ma'am. What is the percent going off of? Like the, the percent what? You mean what are these percents? Yeah, like how do you know what and where's that? So the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, we're not going to calculate it in this course, but it, there's basically, depending on your age and your gender and your cholesterol levels and a number of other things that calculates your risk of dying of a heart attack within the next 10 years. So if that risk is below 5, you're considered to be minimal risk. If it's 5 to 7.5, that's considered borderline 7.5 to 19 is considered moderate, and then above 20 is considered high. Uh, intermediate, uh, mm -hmm. what does like moderate statin mean? So moderate statin means that you're not going to go super high dose. You're going to go relatively low to moderate dose, and the idea is to reduce your um, cholesterol level by about 30%. I think they say 25 to 35%, which is why I say 30 now, there is an additional note on this intermediate risk group right here that you might want to consider the cardiac calcium score. If cardiac calcium score is zero, then they don't need a statin right now. If their cardiac calcium score is positive, then they should start on a statin. So that's kind of the summary of that algorithm I don't want to say in a nutshell, but it's a summary of the algorithm. So you don't have to be 100% knowing all the details of the algorithm. But what you do need to know for your test is, number one, if you've got atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, what should you be on? Statin. What kind of statin? Intensity. High intensity. If you are at the lowest risk, then what kind of statin should you be on? No statin. If you're at this low, um, borderline risk, then what do we want to do? Check to see if there's risk enhancers. If there's risk enhancers, probably start a statin. If there's no risk enhancers, you don't need a statin. The next one is if the patient is at um, moderate risk, so 7.5 to 19%, then we're going to start a moderate statin. And if there's a question, like, I'm not really sure if I want, I don't want to really do a statin, then what test can we do? Calcium, cardiac calcium score. And then for the highest risk, they should start a statin. So you'll need to know that for your test. And again, I'll put this handout into Canvas for you, and I gave it to you today, so you can write all over it with your multicolors. Okay, so um, it's always with the statin because the statins have the best record. Um, if the statin by itself is not enough, then they recommend adding in azidamide, Zedia. And you can also consider a PC or PCSK9 inhibitor, but that's not a strong recommendation at this time because we don't have long term safety data on them. And the cost of PCSK9 inhibitors is quite high right now. So because of those, they're not a recommendation, but they are a possibility. So for your tip, would you use the Gorillastatin for both of them? Yeah, there's, there's no reason not to use a Gorillastatin because you know they're now generic, so why not? What about, where do you like the um, niacin and bile acid suppression? So where do those things have a role? Those are mainly in treating other lipid issues. Okay. So like raising HDL or lowering triglycerides. But really the, the biggest bang for the buck in terms of reducing cardiovascular disease risk is in lowering LDL, specifically with statins. So that's what you need to know for your test. Any questions?